Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back. Our next talk is by Alan. Uh, he is a co-founder of MegaCloud uh, and senior engineer at Redmarker. He's previously worked as a jack of all trades at Yahoo uh, for the last, uh, for over seven years, sorry, and primarily focused on architecture, DevOps, and security. This afternoon, he'll be talking on managing infrastructure as code. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so, wanting to talk about managing infrastructure as code, uh, a bit of uh, a hot topic in recent times. Uh, there's plenty of ways to do it, um, and it doesn't appear that my slides are working. Sorry. Is there a here? What? Sorry. Just a moment, sorry. Apologies for the delay. Almost ready. <coughs> That's it. Okay, back on track. Uh, so managing infrastructure as code. Uh, so what I want to run through, uh, look at uh, a bit of where we came from, uh, just some rough ideas on uh, things to look at, uh, go through a couple of products, uh, maybe sort of think of some requirements of what we want to do, what we want to achieve, uh, look at some newer products maybe. Um, and then uh, go through a couple of uh, more sort of updated concepts and ideas and uh, see if there's any products available that kind of meet those requirements too. Maybe, maybe some more ideas after. So originally, uh, infrastructure was always a very hands-on, very uh, manual uh, concept. Uh, all hosts, uh, all meta information, uh, any sort of software requirement, it was uh, managed sort of ad hoc by the operations team, uh, maybe some infrastructure people, but it was largely, yeah, just a bunch of text. Uh, you, you'd find that host names were sort of uh, based on a pattern to do with their function, so app servers might be app01, app02, and database might be db01, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, documentation was sort of all over the shop too. Uh, could be found anywhere, or it just may not exist at all. So it was uh, a, a bit unmanageable. Uh, things could get forgotten, and you, know, you, might, you might find that you could ping a host, but you don't know what rack it's on, you don't know where it is. It's just a nightmare. And so typically, uh, 
you'd find text files or wiki documents would be the most common places where this sort of information was stored. It, it made sense at the time. There was nothing better, really. Uh, you just have lists of hosts, and if you had uh, text files, you might place it onto a shared drive because you know you don't work alone. There's there's always other members of the team. Uh, you might have a, an internal administration server, but you know you might have shared FTP. There could be a few different ways to go about it. Uh, some big corporations may have even built their own tools. Uh, and then to sort of get by, make things a bit easier to work with, you'd have a few shell scripts. Uh, that way you wouldn't have to remember 5,000 different commands. You just knew if you run this script with a certain argument, then you know, whatever you wanted to happen would be done. Now, there's a few problems with this. Uh, hosts change over time, especially now in more modern environments where you have uh, ephemeral uh, hardware, or no hardware at all, it's just virtualized, uh, you end up with uh, problems where you have multiple people updating the same content, and of course, data is clobbered or missed, lost. Uh, you have no idea of when something was added, when it may have been removed. Uh, some host in a list could just not exist anymore. And of course, there were no interfaces, it was just text documents. And it would take a long time to manage this by hand, because it's just text. There's no clicking buttons, there's no uh, sort of automation at all. So what about, uh, you know, what about the, the, the software stack that runs on each of these hosts? It, you have no idea. So the first thing we want to do is we want to keep track of what's changing over time. We want to see differences in stack. We want to see host names. You know, it's, we need an easy interface for people to co collaborate. Uh, we want to have some way we, where we can say, you know, I want to provision a new database server or something else. Uh, we want to be able to automate the entire lot, uh, whether it's code commit or anything at all. So you've got your different bits of your infrastructure. You've got your databases, your services, all the way up to the applications, the caching layers in between, and whatever other routing you might require. And software, uh, you want to look at uh, orchestrating all of your infrastructure. The software dependencies need to be mapped and managed, and you want to be able to push these uh, within each of those bits of your infrastructure. You don't want to have to remember which applications require what dependencies. Uh, hardware is a, a bit different. Uh, you can't just, you know, destroy one piece and create a new piece. It's it's long lived. Uh, the good thing, though, is you can use a lot of tools on both uh, with the same uh, general ideas. So for these uh, sort of software provisioners, the dependency management, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of products. Um, so starting off with uh, Ansible. Ansible gives you some inheritance, which means you can have basic uh, stack definitions and then sort of inherit from those. Uh, you can uh, specify variables. Uh, could be host names, could be some sort of database username. Uh, whatever you'd like. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to use, uh, especially with automation. And the uh, YAML sort of based syntax is quite expressive and easy to follow. Um, all group definitions are uh, placed within playbooks to make it easy to sort of uh, separate bits and pieces. And uh, the versioning is a bit of a DIY. Um, Typically, you uh, push it to some sort of version control. Um, and you can have a, an agentless model for your deployment, so that way you don't need to have a specific infrastructure running just for your Ansible. Templating allows for configuration file mapping, so you can define, say, an Apache config uh, with a variable for a host name or a log location. Uh, and then when you provision 
uh, an environment, you can specify that at that time. Uh, so a quick uh, example here, uh, from the left to the right, uh, you have a, a playbook on the left where uh, a set of hosts is a variable. Uh, using two roles, uh, a common role and then an app server role. Uh, and on the right are uh, six different files, uh, seven, sorry, uh, three in the common, play, uh, common role and four in the app server role. Uh, so common might be your uh, time zone configurations and uh, sort of shared functionality. And then app server might just be for web server components, uh, which couldn't be uh, an Apache config, for instance. With Ansible, though, you can also provision uh, dynamic infrastructure. So again, reading from the left to the right, uh, this uh, very small configuration would uh, create an instance in EC2. There's a couple of uh, parameters. So you can specify an AMI ID, uh, which means that you don't need to hard code uh, specific AMIs. You can change them over time. Um, and allow for easy updates, especially uh, on post-commit hooks. There's a few drawbacks, though. Uh, some sort of uh, difficulty can be found when you're trying to keep track of what instances are being provisioned. Uh, the, the EC2 functionality itself is provider-specific. So if uh, you wish to do something different, uh, then you need to make sure that the Ansible infrastructure, the, the version of Ansible that you're running, uh, has that capability. The versioning itself is uh, DIY, so you have to make sure that you keep track of each version of your config. Uh, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite simple. Uh, it, it's not as, uh, I guess, at an enterprise level. The next tool is uh, Chef. Uh, Chef is based on Ruby uh, for its syntax. Uh, it's quite fluent, though, in the way that it uh, pushes out modifications with a server-to-client model. Uh, it has variables, again, that make it easy to keep track of automation and what's changing. Uh, each of the instructions and the instruction sets are stored within cookbooks, uh, which sort of makes it easy to, again, group those uh, commands and sets into logical uh, places. And the, there's a concept of a chef server where cookbooks can be stored. So that way, there's a central versioned uh, repository. I oh, said so the server to client. So uh, a quick example of uh, creating some instances. Uh, at the top, we have a variable to specify we want 10 instances created. And then we run a loop uh, from one to that maximum number and uh, set up the machines that we've defined you know, within the subnets and of the instance types. We can also create resources. Uh, so this example here is a, a quick load balancer resource, um, specifying the port and the protocol and what we want to allow and perhaps what we don't want to allow. Uh, there's also an array of uh, host names. And in this case, it's just machine one and machine two. There, there's a few drawbacks, though. Uh, you need to have a dedicated server just for the chef management. Uh, it's based on Ruby, which is not necessarily your language of choice. Uh, so it can be. Uh, uh, might take a little bit of time to get used to using Ruby or building on top of that. And uh, it has a, Chef has a plugin infrastructure, which is great, uh, assuming your plugin exists uh, for whatever functionality you require. Uh, for instance, any sort of AWS specific uh, functionality requires the AWS plugin. And there are, some uh, restrictions on what operating systems and uh, packages you can use with the uh, nodes that you wish to push to. Our next tool is Puppet. Uh, Puppet's quite simple with its syntax uh, for the configuration. 
Uh, it also has a server model for its deployments. And it's, it's very easy to automate, very easy to script and keep track of. Uh, the configurations make uh, environment specific settings uh, very easy. So a simple uh, software dependency example is, let's say we want to add Apache 2. Uh, we specify the command we want to install Apache with. In this case, it's apt. Uh, and then we have a, a quick check to make sure that Apache is running once it has been installed and started. And if everything's working fine, we, we push back to say, yes, it's functioning. If we want to provision some resources, uh, in this case, we have a security group followed by an instance. Uh, very simple EC2 commands where you just specify you know, what, what you want to happen and what you want to make sure is uh, available once the command is completed and uh, connecting the two together. For the final uh, resource, we can create a load balancer and then place the uh, previous instance that we created within the pool of resources for the load balancer. We can specify what zones it's available in and uh, security groups, what ports are open, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, there are problems. Uh, Puppet is quite specific with its uh, language. It is uh, quite readable, though, so it's, it's not completely bad. Uh, the, if, if you have a very complex infrastructure, it, it can be quite difficult to manage. Uh, it can get a bit clobbery with the different configuration files. Um, all of the uh, commands that are run with Puppet are dependency-based, so it can be tricky to have your order execution mapped correctly unless you are very careful. Uh, but in more recent versions, this has become much less of a problem. So we've sort of talked about software mostly, uh, a bit about provisioning, but there are some tools that are mostly uh, there for instances, resources, uh, that type of thing, not just software. So in this case, we have CloudFormation. Uh, CloudFormation gives you a sort of a faux physical complete infrastructure as code uh, capability. It has a JSON schema uh, for its definition set. Uh, all AWS services are readily available uh, to be configured within it, uh, as heavily coupled within AWS itself. But it will keep track of all of your configurations, and it will version and store all of that for you so you don't have to. Uh, and it's very easy to automate. The, the JSON file itself uh, can be quite big. So to begin with, you might have some meta information. You might say, you know, the date, the version. Uh, you'll have a name for your template. And uh, you might specify some keys. Uh, then you can say, oh, we want a security group. So you add your definition in for the security group. Uh, you could say, let's just open port 80 in this infrastructure, or in this particular uh, security group. Uh, and then you might want an instance. Uh, you could say, you know, we just want an EC2 instance, and we want to use yum to install HTTPD. Um, and then you could specify, okay, place it within that security group that we just created. And then uh, at the end, we want to say, you know, for we've got some outputs that we're expecting at the end of this. So make sure that when all of our instances and all of our resources have been created, that they're now accessible, and you know, everything's functioning as expected. Of course, uh, we still have some drawbacks. So it's AWS specific, uh, which is fine if you use AWS, but it, it is somewhat limiting, but AWS is uh, pretty advanced. It's, uh, the JSON configuration file is, is good to have, uh, but there's a few problems. It's quite 
uh, verbose, and uh, there's no easy way to have comments. Uh, for the most part, it's not idempotent. So when you run certain commands twice, you will have different results, uh, or you may have errors. And the templates are just very large, and they can be very difficult to keep on top of if you are not very careful. Most of the functionality is readily available to be automated through other tools. Uh, so CloudFormation doesn't have to be used just for, uh, if you want to automate with AWS. So with your infrastructure, uh, there are three typical sets that you want to look after. You've got your software, you have your hosts, and you have your resources, uh, where resources are hosts that you don't manage the software within. Uh, a general tool provides one, but not the other. So you may have a tool that looks after just the software stack, and you might have another tool that looks after the uh, physical stack. Uh, it's easy to set up some scripts yourself, just a few shell scripts to sort of uh, remember, make it easy so you don't have to remember certain commands. Uh, though it does make it easy to duplicate items that you don't want to be duplicated, and uh, inconsistencies can arise uh, very quickly, and it can be very problematic uh, depending on what tools you want to use. There's a third set of tools where we combine these together. Uh, software dependencies can be managed. Uh, resources can be managed. Uh, hosts can be managed. And you can specify certain software dependencies within certain resources. Uh, configurations uh, can be specified for any number of different cross-communications within infrastructure sets. And with a single command, you can bring up any number of resources, specify the software within them, map their dependencies, and then have them easily communicating within each other. An example is Terraform. So with Terraform, you can orchestrate any sort of resource you'd like. You can specify how those resources talk, what's running on them, what ports are open, whatever you'd like. Uh, it has a very simple syntax, uh, makes it very easy to manage, very, uh, it's, it's quick to get up to speed on using it. The configurations that are maintained are very simple. Um, and there's a lot of parameterization options that makes it very easy to uh, orchestrate large environments with many different options. A quick example of uh, a software provision. So we create a AWS instance, uh, just a EC2. We specify uh, the, the username that we want to connect with. Uh, we pick the instance type. We might specify an AMI. Uh, we can put in the security groups, uh, subnets, whatever you'd like. Uh, and here we can specify that we want a remote execution provisioner to run, and we give a few commands. Uh, specifically, we, we run apt. We get everything up to date, and then we might put nginx on, and we'll start nginx. For resources, if we want a load balancer, uh, we can say, you know, resource AWS E or B. Uh, we can give it a name to keep track of it put it within a subnet or multiple subnets, uh, give it a security group. Uh, then we use listeners to specify some ports that might be open. Uh, we can create some keys. Of course, still there are some drawbacks. So each vendor that Terraform supports is written specifically for Terraform. So it, it only supports what it supports. You, it has to be available within Terraform itself. Uh, the syntax is very nice and clean, but it does have a bit of a learning curve because it is quite different. Uh, inherently, 
as each vendor is individually built into the product itself, there can be delays as new functionality is made available by each vendor. It's a, it's a relatively new product as well, so there, there may be some uh, features that aren't quite ready yet. Our final product is uh, Manager Cloud. So Manager Cloud provides a complete orchestration and provisioning concept. It's simple, it has a reusable configuration uh, for, uh, flow. It keeps track of versions and deployments with your infrastructure. And there's no uh, vendor lock-in, there's no specific uh, aspect within the tool suite itself that is written for any particular vendor. It's a framework approach, so it's completely open to whatever tools, whether it's open source or closed source that you'd like to use. The main uh, code as a configuration used within Manager Cloud is called a Mac file. It's the template that stores your full configuration. It has your complete infrastructure specification, everything from uh, your instances to your resources, uh, if you want to manage your DNS automatically. It, it's entirely open-ended. Uh, the versioning gives you very easy capabilities to use, deploy, and rollback infrastructures. And there's uh, a very simple syntax uh, with no specific vendor uh, commands. So our first example here is uh, creating an application instance. Uh, we start off with a role where we specify a, a demo app. And with the demo app name, we can refer to that later. And we say, you know, we want to create an instance with the configuration of demo application. Then for our infrastructures, we say, you know, we, we want to have an infrastructure named demo application instance. And this, again, is just a name that we will use later. Uh, we say we, we have a provider, and we have a location, and you know, we, we specify some, some other options uh, and use the master branch. For resources, uh, if we want to have, say, a load balancer, we, we might create a, a load balancer called Elastic Load Balancer, and we we specify how it's created and how it's destroyed. And here, we simply just use the AWS command line tool uh, provided by AWS itself. Uh, with the few parameters there uh, for the, say, the load balancer name, the listeners, the availability zones, the region, uh, et cetera. And for the uh, instances of the resource, uh, we have the definition, and now we just provision the instance. So we might say load balancer one, and we say the resource is the elastic load balancer that we defined previously, and these are the parameters that we want to give. So we specify the name, we put in the listeners, uh, we say you know we want to allow for HTTP on port 80, and we say you know we want to make it available. Uh, in US East 1B and US East 1C. And then now we have a, an, uh, a load balancer ready to go. We want to go ahead and associate our instance for our application within the load balancer. And first off, we specify some actions because uh, we will need to know the, the instance ID uh, so that way we can put the association within the configuration. And then we, we need to run the command to register the instance within the load balancer itself. And again, this is just using the AWS command line tool. And within that command, we have our parameters that are specified within the rest of the infrastructure. And we don't need to worry about having to run any of these commands or make sure that we've uh, got the right uh, numbers and values within them. So, so still some drawbacks. Uh, at the moment, uh, some of the components are not open source. 
so the command line interface is, uh, but not everything is just at the moment. And due to the framework nature, it's very open. It means that there's no specific syntax that is unified for each of the different providers. Of course, with all of our infrastructures and management and code and whatnot, there's people. There will always be people, even when everything is automated, people. So DevOps. DevOps largely was a, a hybrid of this uh, operations and development and infrastructure management. And they sort of uh, help facilitate all of the process change. The biggest focus is just on automation, uh, especially as infrastructures are large, they're ephemeral, they come up, they go away. It, it's, it's, everything happens at once. And yeah, DevOps, they're not operations people, but they're not development people either. And they still end up being both. They give the uh, big sort of uh, interface of translation between infrastructure, environments, and deployments. So, yeah, humans are always necessary, even with automation. Uh, it's, it's great to automate everything. We can write tests to keep track of everything, but sometimes a, a quick sanity check might find something that can't be automated. Uh, one of the key concepts with uh, DevOps and uh, people within those types of roles uh, is just removing bottlenecks. So deployments traditionally could take hours and hours, but with all of these tools that have been born out of this concept, it's much, much quicker. Keeping the productivity levels high all across, tech teams, not tech teams, uh, just everywhere within a business. And they, they know all of the management tools and the details of how every part of the infrastructure functions. So somebody still needs to know that even with all of the code that specifies all of the infrastructure, what each piece does, where it fits, how it all works together. So processes are a very important part of this. Uh, you can have all the best tools that are available anywhere, but unless processes are specified that make this easy to follow, they're pretty much useless. What I said. Uh, and automation always brings the operation part to the DevOps part. Cross-functional collaboration between many teams helps to facilitate this automation and remove those bottlenecks. And as the size of infrastructure increases, it is more and more important that all of this automation is spot on and is managed very well, and that's where DevOps really shines. So then we come back to infrastructure as code. So you need to make some decisions if you're thinking about your own infrastructure. Every situation is different. Every piece of uh, infrastructure, every aspect of automation is very different to another. It's, it's not always necessary to go for a complete solution. Uh, you might not have much in the way of instances or resources, but you might have a, a grand software stack and you need to manage those dependencies. So you might just pick a software management system rather than a full system. And it comes down to what people are comfortable with and the knowledge that people already have. And just because many people use one particular product doesn't make it a good product. So there's always options. There's always more available. Um, there are a bunch of tools that I haven't covered, like CF Engine, SaltStack, Heat, OneOps. And of course, it just comes back to automation, removing bottlenecks, you know, getting rid of those cumbersome processes. And we look to the future. What else do we want? We want uh, better ways to share and extend upon these infrastructures, these code pieces, the tools. We want to be able to work better within the infrastructures themselves. We want inheritance. We want roles, resources, instances. We want to say, you know, I want the same as that instance, just a little bit different. 
and we still want to have complete control of all of our infrastructure, even though it's automated. We still want to make sure that things are running, that everything's ticking over. And we just want it to be simple. It doesn't need to be complex, it doesn't need to be difficult. It's just very simple. And that's me done. Uh, questions? So, quick question. Um, obviously, a lot of the tools and technic technologies you're looking at are all like very AWS centric. Um, from an organization that's pretty much embedded that they're going to run their own private cloud primarily on VMware, do you have any alternate technologies you'd recommend other than VMware's self touted products? Uh, not, not specifically. Um, I, I used AWS with each of the tools just because it sort of tried to keep a flow. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Which, which one really, uh, it was just, I, I felt that it was nice to be able to say that you know, within one tool, AWS might look like this. Within another tool, the same commands might be slightly different syntax. Uh, and that way you get a feel for how much code is there as a part of each of those tools for that particular purpose. Uh, for sort of local virtualization or just virtualization for, with VMware, uh, I don't think there's any particular reason to use anything besides what VMware may offer, uh, especially if it's their own tool, they manage it, it's for their infrastructure. No problem with that. Do you, ha do you have any experience or advice on getting sysadmins who are used to the um, hands-on bespoke model to switching over to um, this more automated model uh, well, in terms of creating and destroying infrastructure, uh, you could sort of talk about it in a way where they might be able to watch infrastructure coming up, bits and pieces, and then you could make it a game where they get to destroy it, and you could even go ahead and put some visualization on that where you might have an army and of each different instance, and then you know people throwing fireballs at them, and as each resource goes down, so do the people. You could make it fun, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to be able to see the increases in effic efficiencies just by having small snippets of code that can then be run as a part of a larger set of commands in a bigger in environment rather than remembering individual little bits and pieces, as valuable as that is, uh, it's just a lot easier to manage and they can then focus on other things that they'd like to look at. There's time for one or two more questions, if anyone has any, we'll finish early. Nope. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. Please give a hand for Alan. Thank you. It's afternoon tea at the moment. I believe it's being served back out in the foyer. There's a 40-minute break, and the next talk will be at 3.40. <laughs>